Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, West Coast Weather Watch. Today is September 23rd, and right now we're going to talk about El Nino. We're going to talk about the general circulation pattern that El Nino brings, compare it versus La Nina. We're going to look at some of raw data here for the West Coast North America that I've compiled over the years. We're also going to look at the Climate Prediction Center and see what it says. We're going to check out some other oscillations. We'll look at some of the past El Ninos here as well. And you can see this is where we measure El Nino across the equatorial Pacific, 5 degrees north and south of the equator. And this goes from about 170 west to 120 west for the Nino 3.4 region. I'll also show you some new indexes being manufactured here by climatologists as far as just how to measure the effects of El Nino towards the end of the video. Now looking at the September 14th discussion, talked about the 95% chance virtually lock of El Nino existing into the early spring, pointed at El Nino. We are already there and a 71% chance that we're going to strong El Nino and we may already be in that territory as we speak. And there's a, also a chance that we may be a very strong El Nino, which is over two degrees Celsius above normal sea surface temperatures across the equatorial Pacific there as well. Now taking a look here, this is the Climate Prediction Center. They put up these interesting discussions once a month. This came out September 21st and they talk in detail about what's going on they talk about the madden julian oscillation talk about el nino they talk about sea surface temperature anomalies here and you can clearly see it across the equatorial pacific there's still some cooler water by hawaii there but this is the signature for el nino and it exists off the coast of south america out across the equatorial pacific there this is looking at something that kind of shows how the atmosphere ties in with El Nino. So this blue area is where the clouds are. So this is increased convection, kind of a classic signature for El Nino. So that's one indicator that the atmosphere is starting to respond. There's also decreased convection here across some of the maritime continent. Uh, uh, over towards Asia there as well. And in La Nina, this tends to be reversed. More on that here in a minute when we look at the walker circulation coming up. And so how do we know if the walker circulation is starting to show El Nino conditions? Well, one good way... Um, First, let's go over the neutral conditions here. You can see we usually build up warmer water here in the Western Pacific. Kind of the currents of the Pacific Ocean carry that warm water that's heated by the sun, push it off towards the Western Pacific here, and that's generally where the warmest water resides. So neutral conditions, you're getting somewhat of enhanced convection here, typically over the Western Pacific. And you can kind of see that the ocean currents across the Pacific Ocean here and building up that warmer water here across the Western Pacific. Now, even though it is abnormally warm here across that El Nino region here, the equatorial Pacific across the Central and Eastern Pacific Ocean, it's still actually warmer here across the Western Pacific. So this is just kind of changing up the anomaly here, but it does change the atmospheric pattern. And I'll show you how in a minute. We're looking at the walker circulation now. So La Nina uh, this actually increases the deep convection here across the Western Pacific here. You increase this trade wind flow, you bring some upwelling, you extend that cold tongue out across the equatorial Pacific there, and you build up even warmer water across the Western Pacific. And this changes all kinds of things. It changes the basic mean trough and ridge position, Rossby waves, which we're going to go over in a little bit of detail here coming up in a moment. But looking at El Nino, kind of reverse, we increase some of this convection across the central and eastern Pacific Ocean there. So we change that entire Rosby wave train and we change just how the storms and the ridges develop and who gets what rainfall. And this can change the weather patterns across the world. Now, another way to look at this here to see if the atmosphere is playing with El Nino here is the Southern Oscillation Index. What is that exactly? So here we have Darwin, Australia and Tahiti over some of the central Pacific, just south of the equator here. And when you have El Nino conditions, you can measure the pressure differences here. And once the lower pressure comes here over Tahiti and a tie over Darwin, that means you're getting that increased convection here. And you can tie that up like we looked at the on outgoing long wave radiation, meaning there's more clouds and convection here across the central Pacific Ocean. And the lower pressure there kind of shows that this uh, change in the walker circulation has occurred. So again, lower pressure here for Tahiti and higher pressure for Darwin during El Nino. And La Nina conditions are the opposite. We've got the enhanced convection across the Western Pacific and higher pressure here for Tahiti. So making these uh, readings here for the pressure differences between Darwin and Tahiti can kind of tell you what the Southern Oscillation Index is showing. So now looking back in history, check it out. You can see the Super El Ninos back in 82, 83, 97, 98, where clearly the the pressure was higher in Darwin, uh, or Darwin, Australia here, and it, it's a lower over Tahiti. And so that means you, that you had the classic signature here during the strong El Ninos, and even the 2015, 2016, you can see it there as well. Now you can see our triple dip La Nina here where it was pressure was higher in Tahiti there. We were pushing that water, the warmer water, into the Western Pacific, and that changes everything downstream. But yeah, you can see that there. And now if you look at the very last couple months here, we've got this emerging El Nino. 
Nino, and we flipped this pattern towards SOI, the Southern Oscillation Index negative, which means we're starting to lower some of that pressure across the Central Pacific. So the atmosphere is starting to align with the El Nino conditions at the sea surface. Now, looking at this, you can see Nino 3.4, 1.6. It's already into strong territory right now. And you can kind of see as we've gone from last October all the way in towards March, April, we merged into the positive territories there in Nino 4. Nino 3.4 here, it took about till mid-April and we got into the positive territory. And you can see the slow, steady climb towards El Nino conditions as we go on and through September here as well. Now, I show this sometimes in my daily briefings, but you can see the distant La Nina here, and you can see the really warm water started to emerge across the coast of South America. And this measures between 15 south and 15 north here. So we're measuring the equatorial waters here across the Pacific Ocean. But you can see this is the timeline. So this would be February 28th at the top. You've got August 21st there at the very bottom. And on this one here, I just scrolled it out a month. So we're looking at March 30th there and September 21st at the bottom. And you can clearly see the developing El Nino with the warming waters across the Pacific Ocean there and maintaining that warmth across the coast of South America. Let me back up there again. But there is a catch to all this because even though we're developing this El Nino, as you can see, a lot of the waters across the rest of the globe are very warm, including the Northwest Pacific Ocean here and still across the uh, Pacific Northwest coastline here and out over across some of the North Pacific Ocean here, Western Pacific. It's been very warm, including the Atlantic, some of the Arctic and some of the Indian Oceans as well. Indian Ocean as well. There's only one Indian Ocean out there. But you can see at the, the, the Atlantic, if you guys have been paying attention to some of the social media, have you heard about a lot about the chirpings of some of the record warmth there going on across the North Atlantic. So when you get this anomaly, which tends to bring the differences with El Nino, how is this going to react in some of this record warmth across the rest of the ocean? And in all truthfulness, it's kind of unprecedented territory. So we don't really fully understand that. So we just have to kind of go with what we have with the current El Nino right now. And, you know, we have to wing it basically where this is uncharted territory, the very warm oceans across the planet. So looking at Nino 3.4, this is a kind of a comparison here between the El Nino emerging now. You can see as we've been warming up here as we go through the summer months, and now we're into fall, but you can see 2023 actually lining up fairly well with 1997 with a pretty strong warm up here and potentially going on into a, a very strong El Nino potentially. Maybe we'll get to that two degree Celsius line there for the sea surface temperature anomaly, but you can see, you know, a pretty good rise here across the Nino region 3.4. Now, however, a strong El Nino does not necessarily equate to strong impacts locally. And that's why we turn to this, uh, the Climate Prediction Center here. They do these seasonal outlooks and they put these out and they go months out into advance here. So we can kind of get an idea of some of the best minds in climatology and see what they expect. So if we look here, this was issued September 21st. You can see the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast below average here for the October, November, December period. If we scroll ahead here, you can see again Pacific Northwest and a lot of the West Coast above average as we go through December. But watch as we get towards January now. California kind of calms down a bit here, maybe central and northern California, a little bit above average, but you can see, are we going to get that subtropical jet stream, kind of the classic signature of El Nino, bringing above average precip into California? It's the CPC likes to think so. And you can see, as we go through January, February, and March, you can also see that enhanced signal for Southern California, places like extreme Southern Nevada and Arizona. But look at the Pacific Northwest, above average temperatures and below average precipitation signal. This goes through February, March, April, again with California there, above average precip in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, every single month going on in through the early portion of 2024 has that above average precipitation, below average precipitation and above average temperature outlook. Now, this is something what we call Rossby waves. So you can kind of see the cold air, you know, and as the sun's, uh, the the direct rays of the sun sink south of the equator. Of course, we don't heat the northern hemisphere as much. And then we start to build the colder air. We start to build the stratospheric polar vortex here. We start to get colder air. The gradient increases across the mid-latitudes. And we get what's known as Rossby waves. And you can see a ridge here would be across the Gulf of Alaska, troughing across the USA, ridge out here across the Atlantic Ocean. And this is always ongoing here across the northern hemisphere. But El Nino kind of changes up how these Rossby waves and ridges react and they usually take shape in different areas. We're going to look at some of that here coming up in a moment, but I'm also showing you here that gradient between the polar and equatorial regions of the mid-latitude cyclones are where these Rossby waves exist. 
Now, of course, the stronger the gradient between the North Pole and the polar areas here in that cold air and the temperature across the equatorial regions here, of course, the stronger the gradient, which means stronger the wind, the stronger the storm. Now, this is looking all the way back into 1998 February, where Los Angeles had one of their most intense monthly rainfall records. I believe it was up over 13 inches. And you can see just storm after storm battering the area, enhanced by a strong subtropical jet stream as it continued to move into California. If we watch this here, look at that strong jet stream just burrowing into California here over and over again during February 1998. And you can see that tight gradient. And this was enhanced by the El Nino circulation. And you, this is September 1997, where you can kind of see that warmer water was already building up quite nicely off the coast of South America, extending across the equatorial Pacific. So kind of a classic El Nino signature. This also shows the 1968 through 96 average here. So we're looking at the 200 millibar wind up towards 39,000 feet. I had to think about it there for a second, but you can kind of see the, the standard jet stream there for this nearly 30 year period compared to the 97, 98 El Nino. And you, what you, the takeaway from this is the, the more uh, robust subtropical jet stream making it all the way across the Pacific and pointed into California here helped en enhance that storm track into California during this time period. Now, there's other oscillations that are going on. The Pacific North American Oscillation, positive and negative. And this kind of just, uh, it can line up with El Nino, but at the same time, it's going to go through these different phases as we go through the fall and winter months. So you can kind of see this kind of looks like more of a La Nina pattern here. And this is a positive pattern where the storm track is out over the Pacific Ocean. You get a stronger subtropical jet and maybe more moisture for California. But of course, you're going to flip flop between this during any, you know, fall, winter and spring season as we go. So this is just kind of showing you what the North American oscillation negative and positive look like here. I've talked about this in some of my daily briefings before. This is something we will go over during the fall and winter months as well to kind of see what's coming down line. So this I took actually, I believe uh, this was yesterday afternoons or maybe it was the previous day. But anyway, you can kind of see as we're dealing with the stormy pattern here out over the Pacific Ocean, as that trough kind of moves inland here, we go into the PNA negative and then we're going to bounce back here a little bit as we go through October, if you believe that or not. But you can kind of see this is the Pacific North American Oscillation as of the European Extended Model Run. So it kind of gives you a picture of what we can expect as we go on in through November. I'll cover those on basically a day-by-day -day basis as we get into the fall and winter months here, though. Now, looking at... The differences between when these Aleutian lows here in the subtropical jet point into the west coast of North America, it really starts to ramp up as you get on in towards January, February, March, and April here. You get the stronger gradient and the effects of the El Nino circulation start to really take hold as you get on into the early portion actually into the next year. So 2024, January, February, March, climatologists are really going to be looking at what kind of precipitation starts to roll into California. It's going to be very interesting seeing this strong El Nino. You know, they're fairly rare and we only have a limited, you know, amount of them to look at. The sample size is not that great. And we kind of threw a monkey wrench into things here with that last El Nino, 2015, 2016, where it kind of brought that storm track up into the Pacific Northwest a bit more versus California. And it was really a forecast bust as they were calling for a lot of precipitation for California that did not materialize. Now, looking at the uh, Madden Julian oscillation, I just wanted to cover this really quickly here. And the CPC mentions that it's been kind of a, been in a weakened presentation, the Madden Julian, and when it exists inside the circle here, it's in a weakened state. And the MJO is, you know, the El Nino is basically a, an extension of the MJO, meaning that you've got the warmer waters, like we talk about, across the central Pacific Ocean and the eastern Pacific Ocean, and that can kind of mute and mess with the Madden Julian oscillation signal. So we're not going to talk about it too much, but I'll just kind of give you a brief rundown here. As you can see, you've got areas that get increased rain, and this cycle usually goes around the planet between 30 and 60 days. So this will move generally from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent here, and then you can see it kind of emerges out of the Pacific Ocean. But with El Nino around, it can really kind of mute and make it difficult to pick up exactly what the MJO is doing. So it's, a, it's more of a beneficial forecast, I believe, during neutral years or probably even La Nina years. But if you look here, you can see the, the different phases for the Madden Julian Oscillation here. It's over the Indian Ocean. It moves over the maritime continent and out over the Pacific Ocean here. And this would mean more of kind of like a La Nina type setup here. We got the ridge out over the Gulf of Alaska, bringing that cooler northwesterly flow into North America here. And this would be stage three. <clears throat> 
Stage seven, a different scenario. You've got the deeper convection closer to the Central Pacific here, stronger subtropical jet, and that moves into California there with the Aleutian Low spawning those storms into the West Coast, generally California though, not Pacific Northwest. But there's a catch to that as well, which we're going to look at a little bit of detail here in a moment. And the, the QBO here, we're not going to talk about this too much because the Climate Prediction Center does not mention it. The time I, I looked at a study or two here and they mentioned that it really gets muted during El Nino years. And frankly, I have not studied this too much. The Climate Prediction Center does not mention it. So we are not going to talk about it too much. And here's that uh, study that I mentioned here. The QBO signal is enhanced during La Nina and is nearly absent during El Nino. I'm not fully aware of what that means. I have not admittedly not studied this enough to be speaking intelligently about it. So anyway, we've also got things like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And you can see we are in a negative phase now. So I kind of wonder, will this help keep the temperatures a little bit subdued here, maybe across some of the Pacific Northwest? Um, but yeah, uh, we'll, I'll probably go into the PDO a little bit more in a future video as we go. Uh, but I will show you this here. This is the El Nino Southern Oscillation on the bottom here. You can see El Nino, clearly the warmer waters across the Central Pacific and the Eastern Pacific and La Nina. And so with El Nino, you tend to, tend to uh, correlate with positive PDO here, the positive phase where it's cooler out across from the North Central Pacific Ocean and warmer along the West Coast. But it's interesting because we have the El Nino conditions going on right now and we are actually in the negative phase, which means warmer water out here. And you can kind of see that if you look off to the right of the screen here where I'm pointing, you can see that warmer water here. It's still pretty warm off the Pacific Northwest, but it's definitely not as anomalously warm as it is across some of the Northwest Pacific. Pacific there. So technically we are in the PDO negative. So maybe that will help subdue some of the warmth that we might necessarily otherwise um, experience here across a lot of the Pacific Northwest. So now let's go ahead and dive into some of the data here. This is some of the fun stuff. Um, wet winters in California are not a slam dunk, but there is ways to tell if you have, or at least there's some emerging science on ways to tell if we're going to be experiencing a wet winter in California. Now, looking at this, Southern California here, all these red dots are El Nino. And you can see that some of these El Ninos have fallen below the average precipitation for Southern California. But you can see the 82, 83, and the 97, 98 El Nino there. So obviously there is a signal to some of these strong El Ninos. And some of the La Nina years will be above average as well, but you don't have those extremely wet years from La Nina until, of course, last year. Which, in my, I hypothesize that La Nina was actually just including California basically last year. I mean, that's one way that you can explain it. Now, taking a look at Northern California, you can see again, pretty good chunk of moisture, good rainfall seasons, 82, 83, 97, 98 with those big El Ninos. But again, it is not a slam dunk. Some of these El Ninos fall below the average threshold. So it's, it's just generally a signal we're looking at. Now, more on that here in a moment. So Something interesting here for the Pacific Northwest. This is SeaTac, Washington. The last five strong El Ninos for SeaTac, Washington resulted in a total of three inches of snowfall, five strong El Nino seasons. And all of that three inches came in one day, Christmas Eve, very early in the morning, December 1998. I can remember that storm. There's my, maybe a few of you guys out there remember that, but I believe it melted during the day on Christmas Eve. But just that one day of three inches of snowfall, it's a pretty good indicator of what to expect for strong El Ninos here in the Pacific Northwest. Now, that was the last five. We have gotten some big snowfalls during El Nino years, so I don't want to just ruin Snow Lover's moment here. But look at the only years with zero snowfall at SeaTac were all El Nino. But... 2019. Remember that February where we had just the awesome snow February here across a lot of Western Washington, a lot of the Pacific Northwest that dropped 21 inches of snow. And that was an El Nino, although it was weak, it was borderline moderate. If we look at La Nina, you can see some of these big years here as well. And every single La Nina year has gotten some kind of snowfall since at least 1981. I believe all the way back. In fact, even much farther back than that. And you can see neutral years sometimes are not as bad as well. But you can get some snowfall during El Nino. There are fa other factors that play here. Now, looking at SeaTac. This is rainfall, La Nina versus El Nino and neutral. This is just raw data. I just took it right off the Excel spreadsheet here. So if we look actually, look at December's. They're actually rainier for El Nino years. If you look at November's, 
that's a pretty strong signal for La Nina, those wet Novembers and lesser amounts for El Nino and neutral years. And as you go into January as well, look at that. Over the last, what, 44 years here, 43 years, El Nino has actually brought more rainfall during January than La Nina did. So it's not like winter's lost here. We're still going to have storms coming through here, most likely at some point. Now, this is wind as well. Look at this for December. The average peak wind gust of the month is actually higher during a December El Nino than it is during a December La Nina. No, Novembers are generally windier here uh, on a La Nina year. But as you go to January as well, again, you have kind of that bump in the signal there for El Nino year. So that's something interesting to watch as well. We can have wind storms across Pacific Northwest. It doesn't matter exactly on the Ocean Nino Index. Now, looking at the temperature differences, this is where we start to get really get crazy across Pacific Northwest. I mean, look at March. 44, about 45 degrees, the average mean for La Nina, 48.3. So you're looking at what, 3.3 degree mean difference. That's a huge increase in temperature. And look at February, you're over three degrees warmer during the El Nino February than you are a La Nina February. Also warmer Januarys, much warmer Decembers. And just about the same November here, probably because you're getting southwest flow with some warmer atmospheric rivers here during La November La Ninas. But yeah, huge signal for December, January, February, March, and even April for El Nino. So remember those cold springs that we've been dealing with, including this year, very unlikely to happen or very unlikely to be any colder than it was last year in this El Nino upcoming year. Hokley and Washington rainfall, check it out for the entire year. Look at El Nino, about 60 inches of rain during La Nina, 70.4. So that's a pretty big signal. That's 10 inches of rain less. December, pretty similar there, but November, um, notably uh, drier. And then you can look at January, pretty similar there as well. But as you get in towards March, you're, you're a little bit underneath again as well. And it generally looks like a wetter summertime too for Hoquiam also during La Nina years, as you can see, May and June, substantially wetter as well. But yeah, October is actually drier also. So interesting stuff here in this raw data. Look at Los Angeles International Airport. This is all El Nino 0.5 or higher. So this includes weak, moderate, and strong El Ninos from 1950 to 2023. If you look at January, look at that huge signal. And look at February, you're almost at four inches of rain average for the month of February. March again, pretty darn wet. But the actual, for December, you're actually a little bit drier during El Nino here as well. But you can see, and once you get into the new year, January, February, and March, you turn on that signal there for Southern California. Now, I kind of rounded this up here. This would be for El Nino, January through March, neutral, and La Nina, and you can clearly see, I mean, you're averaging four inches of rain plus more during an El Nino year than versus a La Nina from 1979 to 2023. And this is uh, something interesting here. So this is the ELI, El Nino index. It's a longitude index, and it kind of shows you where the strongest sea surface temperature anomalies are along the equatorial Pacific Ocean. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail here in a moment. But you can see this emits a very strong signal here as well for January, February, and March. Significantly wetter here for Southern California, for at least Los Angeles International Airport. And this goes for much of Southern California as well. This is strong El Nino versus strong La Nina here. And check it out. So that we're looking at strong El Nino and strong La Nina. You can see we're kind of looking at limited um, sample size here. But what a humongous signal here. Strong El Nino close to 20 inches of rain average for the year, strong La Nina down below seven inches of rain. So kind of interesting raw data, right? I mean, it's very interesting to look at. This is temperatures. There is a difference. I mean, it's it's warmer. You can see you're looking at warmer Marches, February's, January's here, December a little bit warmer here as well. November also, October a little bit warmer, but it's not quite as stark as the Seattle, the SeaTac difference. And this is also strong El Nino versus weak El Nino. You can clearly see kind of a warmer signal emerging there. I mean, you're looking at two plus degrees mean temperature average higher than you are during La Nina, given the small sample size though as well. So anyway, so Los Angeles International Airport, this goes from 79 to 2023. El Nino, January through March. Look at that, 13.73 inches of rain. All La Nina's about six. You're almost double the amount there between January and March. Pretty incredible. 
So this is Sacramento. There's also a signal there as well. Look at El Nino. You're talking about 20 inches of rain a year versus about 17.1 during La Nina conditions. And I believe this goes all the way up through 1950, if I'm not mistaken. It should put it on the graph there. But you can see that signal emerging there in January, February, and March, slightly wetter also. And actually a drier December for Sacramento. Las Vegas, check out the signal here. 5.3 inches of rain during El Nino years versus 3.1 in the La Nina years. So pretty substantial signal there. But you can see uh, Las Vegas is usually struggling to pick up rainfall. I mean, you're still only averaging around 5 inches a year a lot of the time down there, 4 or 5 inches. Now, Lake Tahoe snowfall is something interesting. Here I plug these numbers in, and you can see El Nino, 182 and La Nina about 203. So it's a signal, it's not extreme, so it might it's not gonna probably ruin your skiing season up there across some of the Sierra Nevada. And some areas make out quite well during El Nino years across much of California. That's a different story across Pacific Northwest. And you can kind of see that high act Central Cascades, Washington State. Look at all the El Nino years. The, the peak one here was 94, 95, about 411 inches. And you can clearly see some of these big La Nina years had more. And they have one, two, you know, three, four, five, six years above 400 inches. So you can see there is definitely a correlation between El Nino and La Nina across the Washington Cascades. But it's not like you're getting no snowfall at all. At all. But the La Nina years tend to make out better. This is a lot of data to digest here. You got British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California. If you look at Stevens Pass during a strong El Nino, you're still getting 400 inches of snow. Strong La Nina, though, look at that 640 snow. Call me past 590. And then El Nino, you're still getting snowfall, but again, it's much more difficult to come by. You can see you got Paradise, Mount Rainier here. And as you go off towards California as well, look at this. You're talking about 203 to 207, 515 to 451, even doing a little bit better there during El Nino years across some areas of California. Again, depending on your elevation, usually California higher elevation stations I, from what I've picked up, do a little bit better during El Nino years than they than they do during La Nina years. However, lower elevations are probably not going to make out near as well as what they did last year. We had those cold storms rolling into California, seemed like time and time again, bringing huge snowfall amounts across the Sierra Nevada. Portland, Oregon rainfall. There is a signal here as well. You can see actually December El Nino is a bit wetter and a drier during November and substantially so. And then you go off into January and February, and there is that drier signal for El Nino conditions to get into the early portion of the new year. Portland, Oregon, snow. If you want snow in Portland, you want neutral conditions. Check it out. January, February, averaging over two inches, almost two and a half for January, and higher amounts for December versus El Nino. But look at La Nina, December, not bad here for Portland. But a December El Nino, not looking too hot here. About a half an inch of snow averaged for the month of December. And this is wind, something similar to SeaTac here also with Portland. During El Nino, you tend to be the windiest month is a December El Nino. Same thing for Portland as Seattle, and even a little bit windier during El Nino years for January as well. Um, I mean, Portland's even windier during November. That's a little bit of a flip from Seattle also. Now, this is looking at Northern California and strong El Ninos. So you can see the stations we're doing here. You're talking about Brusk Creek, Sierraville, Blue Canyon, Pacific Isle, Shasta Dam, Mount Shasta, Shasta City. Kind of points out where these are. And you can see the average precipitation and some of these strong El Ninos fall below the average. But you can see 82 and, 80 and 97 here, both strong El Ninos and the strongest of the bunch brought much above average conditions, even to some of the higher terrain here of Northern California, Central California, similar map you're looking at here. And you can see you've got this mixed bag. So these strong El Ninos don't necessarily mean a slam dunk and heavier precipitation for a lot of the area. This is Southern California here as well. And you can see again, the 82, 83, 97, 98, doing quite nicely there. And there was a moderate El Nino in 68 and 69 that was actually the wettest year. So yeah, I mean, El Nino is definitely wetter here across Southern California, but it's not a slam dunk. You could get one of these seasons where you check in with lower amounts. You know, we're just talking about probabilities here. Now, this is looking, if you look closely, you can see the Pacific Northwest here. Here's the BC coast. There's California. This is 2015, 2016, which busted all the climatologists' forecast here for another rainy winter coming up in California. I thought, hey, we got a strong El Nino in 82 and 83, 97, 98. We got one coming in 2015, 2016. So it's going to happen again, right? 
Well, it didn't. The storm track was actually pointed a little bit further north into the Pacific Northwest, but huge amounts. You can kind of see it in the running timeline here, just kind of impacting over and over again, hitting the Pacific Northwest with the big precipitation makers. Now, if I scroll ahead here, if I can get ahead, there we go. So why didn't 2015, 2016, why didn't it bring the big rains to California? Well, one of the hints here is you can see that 98 El Nino, it was closer off into the eastern Pacific Ocean here. And the 2015, 2016 was further out back across the central Pacific Ocean there. So that's why they made the ELI. And this kind of measures the longitude index of El Nino. So we had the better heat, the heat transfer was going on better here. We had that walker circulation was probably set up further out over the Pacific Ocean, which allowed this Rossby wave probably to set up a little bit further off to the west, which pointed that storm track at the Pacific Northwest instead of having that better Rossby wave action here closer to California here, Aleutian Low, subtropical jet stream here, and the deeper convection closer to the California coastline there, pointing that storm track into California that happened in 1998, and especially February 1998. And so that kind of changed up there. So that's why now some people are starting to use the ELI, the uh, and so longitude index here. And like I said, it measured exactly where the greatest heat transfer is taking place. The sea surface temperatures, where they are greater here. And so that affects Rossby wave circulation. It affects the Walker circulation, subtropical jet stream, position of the Aleutian low. All that gets changed. And so that can, you can, it, it can describe El Nino driven variability in the Western U.S.'s us better i plugged some of these numbers into the pacific northwest and it didn't really show up too much the signal did not change but it did show up better for california and even made the signal a little bit clear here especially across southern california now i want to wrap up with this because the the european i went through this in some of my daily briefings and you can see this dotted line here is what actually occurred with the el nino 3.4 index and the red lines are the ensemble runs of the european and you can see they did a pretty good job, even though it eventually it started out a little bit lower than the forecast. It kind of finished up pretty well for September and October. You can see this goes all the way up to April. Then they put out one every month, November 1st. And you can see it did a pretty good job. And the actual sea surface temperatures were a bit higher than most of the ensemble members here as we went through April and May. Then they put one out December 1st. You can get the drift. But look at the pretty good forecast here from the European on the sea surface temperatures there for Nino 3.4. This is January 1st. Again, pretty spot on. February 1st, pretty spot on as well. The sea surface temperature is even a little bit higher than what was shown. And this is March 1st, April 1st, and so on. But you can see as we went through May and June, it, checking in on a little bit of the low side there. So the model is kind of overdoing the heating that was expected during May and June. And here we go into July. There's August 1st now, and of course, September. And we're waiting to see how this transpires. But you can see a lot of the ensembles having us go above that 2 degree Celsius anomaly, which would be a very strong El Nino. So anyway, I hope I didn't confuse you any more than you might have already been with this El Nino thing. Um, I'll eventually probably do a video on the Pacific Decadal Oscillation on itself, but I like to stick to things that the Climate Prediction Center speaks out a bit more, and they don't really directly mention the Pacific Decadal Oscillation in their, their climate forecast as they went into next year. So I decided to leave a lot of that out for this as well. But I hope you guys enjoyed that raw data. Maybe you have a better understanding of the circulation that takes place across the planet and the Pacific Ocean and how that impacts us here across the West Coast of North America. So anyway, I hope you guys like this video. Um, I'm probably going to, yeah, I'll probably just do my regular briefings tomorrow. I'm going to look at a few more things and get a little bit more detail with the forecast here coming up as well. I'm excited about the storm rolling in here. I may go out to the Washington coastline and shoot some waves here and try to watch the wind and the rain roll in here and, you know, get my fill of some storm action after this warm and dry summer that we've had across the region. So anyway, I hope you guys like this video. Uh, click like and subscribe, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow morning.